The Typhoon was a beast of an aircraft, 25% larger than any other single-seater. It could also fly faster than any other fighter aircraft of the day, Allied or Axis. A 24-cylinder, 37-liter monster was the first piston engine to produce over 2,000 horsepower. The punch of a Typhoon's cannons could knock over rail cars and burst open speeding locomotives like pop cans. Yet despite its notoriety and exceptional contribution to the war effort, not one airworthy example of this venerable aircraft exists today. But one man is in the process of changing that. Ian Slater is founder of Typhoon Legacy with the goal of restoring an airworthy example of the famous Hawker Typhoon. Hello and welcome to another episode of Typhoon Legacy podcast. I'm your host, Brad Hodson. I'm here with Ian Slater of Typhoon Legacy. And the project is to put Hawker Typhoon JP843 back into the sky. Welcome, Ian. Hey, Brad. Today we're going to talk about the power plant, the mighty Sabre, Napier Sabre engine that powered the Hawker. It's a huge, amazing engine, 24 cylinders, 37 liters. Ian, you're in charge of putting this back together and putting this on the airplane. Uh, tell us a bit about this. The Sabre is a sleeve valve engine, which was something that had been used in even automobiles in the 1920s. But uh, uh, Frank Halfert, um was very interested in developing these engines for increased power output during the war. Bristol was very successful with their radial sleeve valve engines and ended up bailing uh, Napier out early on in the war. But it was basically complexity due to teething problems and the unknowns with the engine as it entered service and was forced into service. And uh, it's kind of interesting how you, you talked about the, the Vulture, which was also a 24-cylinder X configuration, I believe. So that would have been... It was. Actually, I, I just uh, I saw one in a museum in northern Holland recently, and it was the first time I've ever seen one in the flesh. And right. I took a whole bunch of pictures of it because it's really interesting. But it doesn't... Uh, I don't even know the power output of that. It must have been somewhat similar. I, I know it was unreliable. I know they had them on the Manchesters, and yep. that's why this one was in, in Holland. But... Um, it was quite an interesting piece of machinery to look at. Well, if you look at the history of the Manchester, it was a pretty much a disaster, and a, a lot of it was to do with the power plant. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it was kind of a good thing. I mean, like anything, Rolls-Royce would have probably sorted it out, but after how long? And then, of course, the Manchester was just dropped. Well, and it's interesting because you look at that, and um, people talk about the reliability of the Merlin. The Sabre wasn't reliable. Well, um, that goes back to the, the lead time that Rolls-Royce had to develop the Merlin yep. and prove them. And they blew a lot of engines up in testing. Uh, if they would have had the same luxury with the Vulture, it could have very well been a successful engine. Uh, <laughs> but neither Napier nor Rolls had that luxury at that point in time. True enough. And, and look at the, 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 the Griffin. I mean, that had its teething problems as well. It took a while before they got that sorted out. So it's building engines, not, not easy. No, and uh, that's going to be the case for us as well. Um, it's one discussion that we've had a couple times and with the Merlin, there's so much knowledge, there's so many experienced people around that um, even even our uh, Hawker Typhoon or our Typhoon Legacy guys here, we, we built a Rolls-Royce Merlin 3 to running condition and, and ground operating condition with the help of some of the experts, a lot of help from, from guys like uh, Jose Flores and Peter Grieve, um, but that experience isn't there for the Sabre. So it's not a, a fact that you can just take a, a surviving engine and, you know, take it apart, clean it up and rebuild it, mm. make sure everything's within tolerance and then throw it in an airplane and go and fly. It, to me, and my perspective on this is that this engine really needs to be taken. Uh, once we have everything that we need to rebuild one, rebuild it, measure it, identify everything that's going on, really well document everything that's happening and test it and test it and test it. And uh, to the point of almost... Um, certifying a new engine which is well over 100 hours of running time on the engine but because there's no experience or history remaining to identify what's going to happen when it's in the airframe we need to create that by running and learning the engine and that's going to take time and there's a lot of metallurgy involved with that as well right so 80 years ago when they were building this engine they seemed to have it dialed more or less um that's something else that, that is a factor as well with uh, rebuilding, a, like you said, essentially an engine that has to be rebuilt from the ground up because it doesn't really exist anymore. It's crazy. It, every aspect of both airframe and engine, metallurgy is one of the key issues. And with the Sabre, um, if you talk about, uh, and I'm going to get kind of nerdy here, but you, you talk about uh, the different expansion rates, thermal expansion rates of metals. 
the sabers blocks, cylinder blocks, which the sleeves ride in, are aluminum. It's a material called uh, or identified as DTD one six six, I believe, or one three three. It's a cast in aluminum, and there's a sleeve, a steel sleeve that operates inside that. The tolerances are very tight, and when you start introducing different rates of thermal expansion on different materials, you have a huge issue with the potential to seize. So eventually what has happened, and all sleeve valve engines do this, they have a, a very um, a low expansion aluminum alloy, and then they have a high expansion steel alloy to try and keep the expansion rates up as the engine heats up so that it can keep their tolerances without uh, significant issue. And this is something that's affected us too, because as you know, we've got the Sabre 7 cutaway here. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is uh, heal components. And we can definitely heal a lot of the components that were cut away during the war. But the one thing that I will not heal is the cylinder block itself. And that's, again, because of metallurgy. And the wartime specification for that cast material and our modern repair material for welding anything in there or producing new parts will have slightly different thermal expansion rates. And I think we just risk the engine by trying to repair that. So. Ultimately, the, the cylinder blocks are going to have to be cast new. So back to the to the engine block itself, do you possibly envision yourself literally forging your own engine block? Well, they're a cast engine block, and I believe uh, the capability is absolutely there for the... Um, and I, actually, I should clarify here. The, the Napier Sabre engine is built in two crankcase halves, which are the center of the engine. They house the uh, crankshafts. And then there's the uh, the cylinder blocks bolted on the outside, and then there's cylinder heads on top of that. So there's no no cam gear driving it. The worm drives are on the base of the cylinder block. Um, so we're dealing with crankcase halves and cylinder blocks uh, and cylinder heads that need casting. Uh, the technology is absolutely there. The uh, technical information to do so is available. We have it, um, and it's just a matter of money to be able to do right. that. So I think. When you look at a project like this, when you look at the fact that uh, Kermit Weeks has got a Tempest 5 um, and he also has a Sabre 5, when you look at the fact that there's another project in the UK that's uh, potentially going to operate a Sabre, there's uh, a common sense requirement for spares support that just isn't there right now. And I think it's worthwhile having the discussion about producing spares for this, um, or at least designing, uh, having the information ready to produce the spares if need be. But it's uh, more of a community thing to be able to do that because there's going to be some expensive minimums required to do so. Right. So possibly, ideally, a collective. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, we're sitting next to a, a Napier Saber right now, and it it's amazing how big this engine is. Yet, it's still quite compact. So because of the sleeve valves, it makes it quite compact. But it's still a you know half the size of a small car. It's an amazingly large engine. But because of the sleeve valves, like I said. It is quite compact, and that was part of the design they wanted: is to have a compact yet uh, high output, 200, 2,000 horsepower plus engine. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely compact. They did an excellent job just squishing everything together. If you look at the way the accessories are mounted on top, they really paid careful attention on to uh, to what they're doing. Um, it's interesting though when we had that Merlin three here, we had them sitting beside each other, and there's not that much of a difference between a completely assembled Merlin, like we're talking overall length, overall height. Um, but the Napier Sabre uses that length, width, height much more efficiently. There's less open space in there. And twice the cylinders. And twice the cylinders. <laughs> and yeah, at, at that time, if you compare those two engines, twice the power as well. Something else that I always found really interesting, even as a youngster when I was reading up on this aircraft, was it, it didn't have an electric start. You had to start it with a essentially a Kaufman, a shotgun shells. Yes. Yeah. Actually, it's interesting. You can go on YouTube and you watch old tractors start. They, they used it quite often uh, for some of these bigger engines to turn them over. And that was the exact reason why they didn't have electric starters that could turn over a 37 liter engine uh, at the time. The, the shotgun starter is very interesting. I've, I've seen a few operate, but it does have, uh, um, because of the, the shotgun or the, the surge of power, it has a, a pretty negative impact on the engine. It'll turn it over, but it really shocks it hard. So as much as that is a key part of the identity of the engine, I'd like to see a, an air start system put into this, uh, something that'll preserve the engine for, for a long time and not cause any issues with uh, gears splitting open and things like that. Ian, tell us a little bit about the development of the, the Sabre from, from early on to the further developments uh, post-war. 
Absolutely. The, uh, the Saber, I mean, we can kind of uh, bypass all the teething problems at the beginning, but once it did enter service and, and started getting used and understood, it became quite a reliable engine. Um, throughout the war, when you look at the Hawker Typhoon and the Hawker Tempest, it used two series, Saber two series engines. So um, a lot of the, the listeners are probably familiar that there's a Saber five and a Saber seven that you see in a lot of museums. But during the war, the work was done by the two series engine. And this engine went from being essentially a lemon at the beginning to something that was quite reliable. And I would, based on what I've read, I would argue that it was as reliable or at least as reliable as the Merlin towards the end of the war. Um, the snags had been worked out of it. But what um, they found throughout, I suppose, the lessons learned of combat with this is that there are some weaknesses within the engine, and they, they did develop ways to fix that. And there's a series of modifications with them, as well as design changes to the engine itself to strengthen it. A lot of the strengthening that went into the engine was as a development of the induction systems, because they kept... Uh, trying to increase the power of these engines throughout the war, where you look at um, the the first couple that came into the uh, into service, we were talking about like 20, uh, 2,180 horsepower, whereas 1945 with the Sabre 7, you're looking at a reliable 3,500 horsepower sure. and 0.83 to 1 power to weight ratio. It's absolutely phenomenal. But that was done through induction. So the early and most... Uh, Napier Sabre engines produced, all the two series engines were carbureted, but Napier had uh, gone to an injection system, a Hobson injection system for the Napier Sabre 5, which was actually never put into production. The Napier Sabre 5A was the production variant, and this used an injection system for its fuel management, and it also used a different supercharger than the 2A system. Uh, In addition to that, there was some cooling problems with the Sabre early on, and with the 5, they went and they change some of the uh, the flow directions of the cooling in the head because what was happening was the coolant would enter at the bottom of a cylinder block so you're looking at 12 cylinders it would enter at the bottom it would run along the uh, six cylinders at the bottom then it would go up the other side and it would run along the top six cylinders so it would heat the coolant on the bottom ones and then it would be very warm for the top one so there's a uneven distribution of cooling in them the saber 5 series engines fixed that and threw into the seven Uh, Another advent, uh, basically a development of the Sabre 5, but ultimately its own engine later on was the Sabre 7. And that was a a fuel injected engine that used the same uh, strengthening components that they had put in the engine, um, as well as water methanol injection. So that's the one that was able to reach 3,500 horsepower. And it flew in uh, uh, Hawker Fury LA-610, and uh, that aircraft hit 485 miles per hour. Mm. So pretty significant steps and a, a massive uh, amount of boost required to do that. I think it went from uh, six pounds of boost early on into 17 pounds of boost, which is relatively low for today's standards, but it was very impressive at that time. Right. right. Um, so the Sabre engine actually rolled over into the Tempest, yet earlier on, quite early on with the Tempest, they uh, ended up changing over to a different engine. Do you think, what do you think the reason was behind that if, if the Sabre was gaining traction, becoming more reliable, and still quite a powerful engine. Uh, I'm not too sure. that The way that that happened was um, when you go back to the uh, Typhoon and Tornado competition at the beginning of the war, there was uh, Hawker Tornado was the Vulture variant of the same airframe. Uh, the Vulture, I think the, the biggest change in those two aircraft was that the Vulture actually sat six inches lower in the airframe. It's a pretty significant change to the geometry of the, the structure. But they also did a, a, a Bristol Centaurus variant. Hawker wanted a Centaurus-powered aircraft, and they did so at the beginning of the war, and that's what this uh, Hawker tornado came from. Uh, they also wanted that for the Tempest. Once they, they changed the wing and they developed that uh, design a little bit farther, they wanted that. And that's what you see as the Tempest II. But it, even though it's the Tempest II and the Tempest V saw service in the war, the Tempest II was a post-war aircraft. Um, I don't know exactly why they really wanted the Centaurus with the, the quality of engine that the Sabre turned out to be, uh, but it was definitely on the radar very early on. So the uh, Sabre was kind of abandoned after that. Was it ever really used for anything else? Or No, it uh, it kind of, well, it went the way of the Dodo bird, much like the Typhoon, but it lasted a little bit longer because of its use in the Tempest. The, uh, the Tempest 5s and Tempest 6s 
saw use as target tugs post-war and they operated through till uh, about 54 55 so the sabers operated through into the 50s but that's the last time they've run uh, i've talked to a couple guys that were involved with the disbandment of those units um, and the uh, the destruction and disposable or disposal of napier saber engines in the sea and it's uh, disheartening to hear that uh, we'll, we'll find something one day that uh, that comes out of that you're trying to get a hold of one that'll uh, help you put this project in the air yet there's probably a whole bunch of of them rotting at the bottom of the ocean it's kind of sad to hear it's interesting this is uh i wouldn't call it hearsay it's from my research but i i estimate at the end of the war there was 4500 napier saber engines either overhauled and returned to service or brand new awaiting an aircraft i have no idea and i've never been able to find records where those engines went so that's a pretty substantial lump of big lumps to uh, to go missing so i'm hoping one day There'll be a barn or, a, a, you know, a, maybe an engineering college that opens up its basement doors and just finds a hundred sabers sitting there that were just kind of forgotten about. But you didn't know yeah. what these were. Yeah, we're all dreamers. Yeah. Well, you know, from the research I've done, after the war, people just, the last thing they wanted on their mind was anything to do with the war. So whatever they could scrap, get rid of, chuck in the ocean, just enough. Let's move on and not deal with this. Pretty well. And uh, I mean, the, the typhoon had fulfilled its role. The Sabres stuck around for a little while to basically service the Tempest until they fulfilled their role. But ultimately, um, I, I will forever blame the jet engine for the the, uh, the end of the Typhoon, the end of the Sabre, because it just wasn't practical to keep pushing this technology that was absolutely the peak of piston engine technology because jets were there and they could get more power, they could go faster. Mm. It, it just didn't make sense. So right. it's sad but true. Fair enough. Well, with that, it brings us to a conclusion of another Typhoon Legacy podcast. Thank you much, very much, uh, Ian Slater of Typhoon Legacy. Thanks, Fred. If you want more information on the project, please feel free to visit typhoonlegacy.com. I'm your host, Brad Hodson. Thank you again, Ian Slater. And thank you, Rob Hunt, our producer. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again soon.